Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, uh, Mandana, for inviting me. So um, I was asked to kind of give a lecture on something I might teach in my classes. Um, just to give you guys a nice idea of what you might be uh, learning in political science. And since I'm, I'm, I'm a guy who does Quebec politics um, in the department, I thought I'd talk a little bit about Quebec separation. I mean, a lot of you may know that Quebec tried to separate a couple of times from Canada, but you know, you may, this was probably even before you were born, but you may not know, you know why they did it or how they did it. So I'm going to try to squeeze in in the next 20 minutes, 25 minutes, a bit of an overview of where Quebec was coming from, how they tried to do it, what was the response from Canada. And then I'm gonna to try to link that to future events. Like now, most people will agree that the movement for independence in Quebec is kind of on the decline. You don't hear about it too much, but you do hear about things like Bill 21. You may have heard about Bill 21. And I'm gonna to try to link the Quebec project for independence to what Quebec does, even though they're not trying to achieve independence, something like Bill 21. Before that, there was the Charter of Quebec Values, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So let's start from the beginning. Quebec in the 1960s went through this period called the Quiet Revolution, where uh, the, 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 the liberal party that took over and won the election, decided to seriously modernize Quebec. And so they, they undertook a whole bunch of activities, like they created Hydro Quebec, they, they nationalized Hydro, sorry, um, it's, it's the dog. They nationalized hydroelectricity, they decided to open up a ministry of education, a ministry of international relations, massive secularization. In any case, the Quebec state, compared to the state, the government that was there before under Maurice de decided to become a really activist state. And the idea was to catch up to the rest of North America. Okay? Quebec socioeconomically, particularly Francophones, were well behind the rest of North America. And we get this period in the 1960s called the Quiet Revolution, okay? Now, what happened is one of the cabinet ministers in the Liberal Party, <laughs> I can't stop this. He sees a dog outside. I'm sorry, we will just have to bear with me here. Uh, one of the cabinet ministers in this liberal government was René Lévesque, and he, what he took from the Quiet Revolution basically was, wow, look, just the powers we have in Canada, look what we were able to do with, 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 um, with those powers. Imagine if we got more of those powers and Quebec kind of took care of their own affairs on their own, okay? So you start to see this discourse in Quebec towards the late 1960s around making the Quebec nation an independent state, okay? And really the founder of this was René Lévesque. There were a bunch of other parties doing this as well, uh, but René Lévesque founded this movement called Mouvement pour la Souveraineté Association, Sovereignty Association. And the idea was, let's build on this momentum of the Quiet Revolution and negotiate a new agreement with Canada as equals. So basically what Sovereignty Association was to Lévesque was, that Quebec would no longer be a province like the others. It would be a nation that becomes independent and negotiates a new agreement with the rest of Canada, okay? So there's a sovereignty part, which means independence, Quebec kind of deciding on their own what to do. And there's the association part, meaning it would still have some kind of formal ties to the rest of Canada, but that would be negotiated as equals. It wouldn't be Quebec one of 10 provinces. It would be Quebec one nation, rest of Canada, another nation. And they come together and negotiate the terms of their, um, their relationship, okay? So, you know, the Mouvement pour uh, the, uh, La Souveraineté Association, late 60s, it's starting to develop. It then turns into the Parti Québécois when Lebec rallies a few other independence parties together. And in 1976, the party wins a majority in, 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 uh, in, in, in this 1976 election, and they go on to form the government. Now, this was a, a shock in Canada. Lots of people leave Quebec. Um, you may even have some relatives that lived in Montreal in the 70s, I don't know. Uh, um, and it was a big shock. You know, People were seriously afraid that the country might break apart, okay? But for these Quebec nationalists, the question became, okay, we promised this project for independence, but how do we do it? 
Canada didn't have something in the constitution that gave them kind of a roadmap to separate from the country. In fact, Canada didn't even have its own constitutional amending formula because the amending formula was still in Britain. Canada wasn't formally an independent state yet, okay? So the way Canada changed its constitution conventionally, conventionally means it developed as practice as a custom over time, was that whenever the provinces and the federal government agreed to make a change, they would simply take it to London and London would virtually rubber stamp it, but they didn't have their own formula for changing the constitution. So these Quebec nationalists, René Lévesque and his Parti Québécois had to decide, okay, how are we gonna achieve independence? You know, we're not gonna do it violently. The, the movement, the whole point of the movement was to do this through a democratic process. It was nonviolent. René, René Lévesque was trying to show the world that the movement was very moderate. It was, there was nothing radical about it. Okay. So they decided to adopt a system called etapisme, which means step-by-step. Step. So the idea was this, Quebec would have two referendums. The first referendum would ask the Quebec population for a mandate for permission to negotiate a new agreement with the rest of Canada. Okay, if they got this mandate, meaning if they got over 50% of the vote, they would begin negotiations with the rest of Canada. And once they came to an agreement that would look something like René Lévesque's Sovereignty Association, where Quebec is kind of an independent state negotiating an arrangement with the rest of Canada. Once they got this kind of agreement, they would have a second referendum to ask the Quebec population to ratify it, to accept it. Okay, and so Lévesque was basically going around saying, look, we're not radicals here. We're not trying to break up the country and be violent and whatever. We just want to do this right. And we want to make sure we do it democratically. So the step-by-step -step approach, the two-pronged approach, he thought was the best way to assure everyone that they're only going to do this if they, A, get permission from the Quebec population and B, come to an agreement with the rest of Canada. Okay, now bear with me. Now, the rest of Canada, represented, of course, by the federal government, led by none other than Justin, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's father, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, their response to this was very simple. They basically told Lebec, you could win your referendum all you want, but we are under no obligation to negotiate with you. Okay? The Quebec nationalists running this referendum thought, well, they say that now, but if we get over 50%, they're going to have to negotiate with us. Otherwise, we're going to be in a political and constitutional crisis. But formally, the federal government was saying, there's nothing in the constitution that requires us to negotiate with you. So you can take your, your, your referendum, even if you get 80%, we're not negotiating with you. If you want to come, if you want to reform our constitution, you're going to do it by negotiating with us and the nine other provinces the way we always have. Okay, and remember Trudeau at this point is also trying to find a constitution that he could repatriate from the UK and have our own amending formula and a charter of rights. So Trudeau's position is you can have your referendum, we're not negotiating with you. If you want to negotiate with the rest of Canada, you're going to do it on the terms that negotiations have always taken place through regular constitutional conventions. Okay, so Quebec has a referendum, they lose six, something like 60% to 40%. Uh, and Trudeau basically says, okay, now it's time to renew the federation. The, national, the, the, the separatist loss in Quebec, okay, it's time to renew the federation. Uh, the, the story hasn't gone away in Quebec. We'll see how it reemerges very quickly soon after 1982, uh, 1980, but they have the referendum in 1980. And by 1982, Canada gets its repatriated constitution. Now we can't go into it too much, but the point is the constitution was repatriated, meaning Canada had its own constitutional amending formula, meaning a formula uh, that the provinces and the federal government used to change the constitution. And it had this new charter of rights and freedoms, which I'm sure you're aware of, okay? The key for our purposes is that the constitution was signed without Quebec's consent. They never signed it. In fact, Lebec felt like he was betrayed by Trudeau and the rest of the provinces. But when Lebec objected to having not signed it, he was told that the constitution would still be binding. The Supreme Court said that nine provinces in the federal government is, uh, is substantial consent and um, Quebec was forced to live with the Canadian constitution that they never signed, okay? So I'm going very quickly, but Quebec has a referendum they lose. Canada, forget, finally in 1982, 
gets their constitution, but Quebec rejects it. Okay, so for the next, after 1982, for the next 13 years before the next referendum, Canada is constantly trying to reform their constitution to get Quebec to sign it. And we have Meech Lake and we have Charlottetown. Meech Lake, we came very close, but then it kind of died at the last minute. The idea was Quebec would be recognized as a distinct society and there would be certain powers going to the provinces and that the charter will apply differently in Quebec and Quebec will have control over immigration. All of these things were meant to get Quebec to sign the constitution. Now remember, Sovereignty Association was basically the Quebec nationalist class, Quebecers basically saying, we are not a province like the others. We are a nation and we want to belong to Canada and be recognized as a nation. Okay. Now, some like Lebec wanted to take them out and have this thing called sovereignty association, but others, even the Liberal Party, were still nationalists. And in fact, Meech Lake, with all these exceptions for Quebec in the Federation, was, was um, excuse me, oh, what the hell did I do? Sorry. Meech Lake was actually negotiated by a Liberal Quebec Premier. Okay. So Quebec is basically saying, we are a nation, we need the tools that other nations have to develop economically, culturally, politically, et cetera, et cetera. So Meech Lake rejected. Next, Charlottetown Accord rejected. Now, the numbers for Quebec sovereignty are going much higher. The new Quebec premier in 1994 is a guy called Jacques Parizeau. He used to be Levesque's finance minister. He's a much bigger hardliner. And he says, that's it. We're calling a referendum in 1995, OK? And we get our second referendum. This time, however, uh, there's a few other people on board. There's someone called Lucien Bouchard who had formed the Bloc Québécois, who you're probably aware of now. Quebec has quite a few, uh, quite a few Quebec seats in the, in the, in the House of Commons um, are Bloc members. But the Bloc Québécois was formed by Lucien Bouchard when he was a cabinet minister in the Conservative Party and he got upset that Canada rejected me. He formed his own kind of Bloc Québécois um, and took a bunch of other Conservative uh, MPs with him. And so he was a very charismatic figure. He was supporting the referendum from Ottawa. Jacques Parizeau, the hardliner, the guy who was much more um, radical in a sense than René Lévesque and would go through to much more lengths to, to, to achieve sovereignty than René Lévesque, was leading um, the Parti Québécois. And we were going to have our second referendum. Okay. Now, the reason I bring this up is because Quebec, or Parizeau at least, learned from the, the mistake of the previous roadmap when Trudeau basically said that we are not negotiating with Quebec no matter what. Parizeau decided, okay, so we're going to change our formula. We're not going to have this etapiz formula anymore, okay, this step by step formula. He basically said, we're going to ask Quebec if they support a project for. He didn't call it sovereignty association. He called it sovereignty with partnership or something like that. But he said, then we're going to undertake negotiations with Canada. But if Canada does not negotiate in good faith, and if we don't have a deal within one year, then we will simply declare that we are an independent state unilaterally. Okay. So he said, we're not going to go through what we did last time where Trudeau simply says that your referendum is meaningless. We're not negotiating with you. Okay, all of that stuff. We're going to tell Canada right now, you better negotiate with us or we're simply going to leave on our own. Okay, now Canada's getting worried here. First of all, the numbers in support for the sovereignty project are much higher. Quebecers feel like they were betrayed with 1982 and betrayed with the failure of Meech. Okay, and so the numbers are much higher. People are worried. And then Lucien Bouchard takes over the yes campaign and he's very charismatic. Okay. And so it looks really like Canada's gonna have to have some kind of a reckoning here and deal with Quebec once and for all, right? And Canada was basically still saying, well, we're under no obligation to negotiate. Even though at the last minute, the prime minister at the time, Jean Chrétien, who was very unpopular in Quebec because he was the justice minister in Trudeau's government when they signed the 1982 constitution. And he was seen by Quebecers as an architect of that betrayal, the night of the long knives they call in Quebec. Okay. So things weren't looking good. You have the numbers for sovereignty really high. You have a very unpopular prime minister. At the last minute, he's just basically saying, look, we can give Quebec some of the things it wants, make it a little more independent. 
but we're going to have to do it through the constitution. We can do it through non-constitutional means. Having said that, Quebec has their referendum and they lose. The yes side loses, okay? But this time it was really close. It was something like 50.4% 50, 50 to 49.6 or 50.6% to 49.4, something like that. It was really close. Canadians all over the country were biting their nails. It was a tense moment in Canadian history, okay? Now, I have a couple more minutes. Where am I? Okay, so they lose. Few, a lot of Canadians are saying, good, we dodged that bullet. Now, the federal government was a little worried about this referendum because they basically said, well, you know, this whole idea of unilateral independence by Quebec, this idea that after a year, Quebec, if they want a referendum and we wouldn't negotiate with them, that after a year, they would simply decide we're going to become an independent state and ask, ask countries around the world to recognize us. That was very scary for Cartier. So what he did was he asked the Supreme Court whether or not Quebec could do that under the constitution, okay? He said, could Quebec declare independence unilaterally? And he was simply expecting them to say, no, because the constitution, said, there's nowhere in the constitution that says Quebec can do anything unilaterally to change the status of our political institutions. So he was just expecting the Supreme Court to say, in a reference case, by the way, a reference case is this wonderful tool we have in Canada where the Supreme Court gives you advice, but it's not necessarily a binding ruling, okay? So in this reference case called the reference regarding Quebec secession, Christian was expecting, Christian was expecting um, the Supreme Court to simply say, no, the constitution doesn't give you the right to separate and they clean their hands, but the Supreme Court didn't do that. The Supreme Court basically said, ah, the constitution is bigger than what's written down. The constitution is bigger than what's written down. And just to make a long story short, they basically said, if Quebec asks a clear question with a clear majority, and they have, a, and, and if Quebec has, a, has asked a clear question and they get a clear majority, we're not gonna say what the questions or the majority, with the question or the majority uh, is, then the rest of Canada has an obligation to negotiate with Quebec, okay? So Quebec nationalists who thought this was just a ploy by the federal government were, were rejoicing. They basically said, hey, the Supreme Court just validated our etapism approach, our step-by-step -step approach. They just basically said that if we win a referendum, if we win a referendum, the rest of Canada has an obligation to negotiate with us. Okay, so this was a huge deal. However, the federal government saw it very differently. Because the Supreme Court said that Quebec must ask a clear question and get a clear majority, meaning we don't, we're not sure what a majority is. Quebec thought it was 50% plus one, but in many cases where states secede, you need a supermajority or something like 66, 67%, sometimes 70%, whatever. So what the federal government would say, said was, okay, we're gonna take that to mean that we won't, the obligation to negotiate with Quebec will not be triggered unless Quebec gives us a say in what the question is. So we want the question basically to be very clear. Do you want to separate from Canada and not some kind of, you know, convoluted question about mandates to negotiate that Quebecers don't understand. And we wanna have a say in what the majority is, because Quebec's position has always been the majority is 50% plus one, whereas the federal government said, no, that's not enough. You need a bigger majority. So the federal government said, we're gonna pass this thing called the Clarity Act, saying that in the event that Quebec has another referendum, we will not negotiate with them unless they consult with us first and we agree on the clarity of the question and the clarity of the majority, okay? I hope you're all following me. And so now we have it on our books, excuse me. Sorry, it got, it got dark really quickly. We have on our books, this thing called the Clarity Act. That's the federal government response to the, to the Quebec government's roadmap to achieving secession. Quebec responded by passing its own law, Bill 99, which basically affirmed that Quebec has the right to self-determination. They decide things on their own and the federal government has nothing to do with it. So that the Clarity Act is just some political ploy 
to make it look like the federal government is doing something, but Quebec rejects its legitimacy. Quebec basically says, you know, you can't make a law like that. Quebec independence gets decided in Quebec. You don't get to veto it because you don't think our question's clear. clear. And now we're in this situation where if ever Quebec has this, some event happens in Quebec and they want to achieve independence again, and they follow the roadmap established with the referendum process, they're gonna to have to reckon with this thing called the Clarity Act at the federal level and this thing called Bill 99 in Quebec, okay? We don't think in the near future we'll have this issue come up because as you know, the movement itself has seriously been in decline in the last, like since 1995, but you never know, okay? Having said that, just because the movement is in decline doesn't mean this idea that Quebec sees itself as this internal nation in Canada that wants to run its own affairs, regardless of what other provinces do. Quebec feels, again, it's not a province like the others. And sometimes it feels like it needs to do things differently than the rest of Canada. If I'm slurring, I, I, excuse me, it's just because I have these Invisaligns and it makes me slur sometimes, so excuse me. <laughs> Um, anyway, so Quebec, sometimes there's some arguments out there that basically say when Quebec doesn't have a, a significant independence movement and when Quebecers like seem like they've moved on, then nationalists in Quebec tend to turn inwards and they still want to deal with questions around identity and collective rights of Quebecers, et cetera, et cetera. And what we've seen basically in the last 15, 20 years is Quebec having this you know, incredibly intense debate around how Quebec, the Quebec state should recognize minority cultural and religious practices, okay? And this is part of the same story. Quebec is basically saying, we are a nation, we run our national affairs, and we are the ones that decide what the rights of cultural and religious minorities are in Quebec. That's not for Canada to decide, okay? And so, to make a long story short, because I can go on about this forever, Quebec has been having this debate 2008. They had the Bouchard-Taylor Commission on Reasonable Accommodation. They gave their recommendations. In 2014, the Parti Québécois released this thing called the Charter of Quebec Values. And recently, I think 2019, the, the present Quebec government, the CAQ, passed this thing called Bill 21, which basically says that Quebec will have its own model of secularism that's very different from Canada's. And it basically said that in the public sphere, people can no longer wear religious symbols or clothing, okay? And it does this because it says we want to adopt this different kind of secularism, what we call French, France style absolutist secularism, where the public sphere is going to have zero religion in it. Okay, basically, you're not allowed any religious symbols if you work in certain professions in the public sphere, teacher, police officer, judge, whatever. Whereas the Canadian model of secularism was what we call open secularism, which is the state has no official religion, but as a matter of freedom of religion and freedom of conscience, we allow people to express their faith in the public sphere. So it's still secular because you, you, you recognize a whole bunch of different religious affiliations for individuals, but it's very different than Quebec's absolutist secularism, which basically says zero religion in the public sphere, okay? And you know, the Charter of Values in Quebec tried to do this too. Now, why do I bring this up? You know, what does this have to do with independence? Well, Quebec, even though they're not actively pursuing independence, they're always actively having a national debate about how their nation should deal with these questions that frankly doesn't take into account what Canada wants them to do. So Bill 21 got a lot of criticism from the rest of Canada. In fact, Quebec appended the notwithstanding clause on this legislation, meaning basically that they made it exempt from the charter challenge because they knew probably someone would try to, try to challenge it. And they said, doesn't matter, even if you challenge it, we don't care, okay? And it's basically part of the same story. It's that Quebec makes these decisions for themselves 
because they don't see themselves as bound by these Canadian national values. They wanna have their own model for society. And in the case of Bill 21, it's pretty clear that Quebec chose a different model of secularism. Okay, many, many people are critical of Bill 21, myself included, you know, this idea that you know, certain religious faiths require that pe people wear symbols or certain clothing while others don't. So it's inherently discriminatory. We can get into that debate forever. But the point is Quebec does these things because they basically say our, our nation makes these decisions for themselves. They also want to do this in the area of language. They don't like when Canada meddles in language, culture, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So I'm going to stop here because I already went over. Uh, I'm glad you listened to this. I hope I didn't go too quickly. And um, now you get a nice little overview of what Quebec's been doing in the last 60 years. And if you take my second year intro to Canadian politics, you'll get a couple of weeks on this stuff. If you take my third year constitutional politics, you'll get a couple of weeks on Quebec, but you'll look generally at the constitution. If you take my Quebec politics, you're gonna get many, many weeks of this of constant talking about Quebec. Okay, thank you. And I'm happy to take any questions. Awesome, thank you for that. Um, so feel free to pop any questions you have in the chat or feel free to turn your mic on if you're comfortable uh, speaking. We're more than happy to answer any questions about political science, the lecture, Carlton, anything you have um, to ask, we're here to answer. I'm just going to pick up a little bit on what Professor Acovino talked about. Um, I teach public policy in the department, and some of um, you know what he's described in terms of, of Quebec's history and, and striving for independence um, for all of these decades. Even though you know we don't hear talk about independence or separation, um, that those ideas, the idea that Quebec is a nation, that people of Quebec are you know, distinct and, and a nation is 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 fundamentally um, part of almost any policy debate as well. So whether you talk about childcare or healthcare, whether you talk about economic policy, immigration policy, um, that that sort of striving for self determination is 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 uh, you know central to any um, any policy issue that you can think of, and it, it really. Um, shapes the debate in, in um, fundamental ways when it comes to talking about Canadian policy or any kind of pan-Canadian um, policy issues. Tyler. Amazing. Well, first of all, thank you very much to all of, uh, to all of you for making this presentation. I really enjoyed it. And uh, I guess my question would be, so like you touched on, there's always been this one big tent. The Party Quebecois was the nationalist party. Uh, pretty, like, I, there were third parties, but to the exclusion. Have you seen, like, what have been the implications for you or kind of the effects you see coming in the future based on the fact that the Party Quebecois, the big tent party, has kind of died out and now it's the CAQ and Quebec Solidaire kind of just facing off against each other? That's an excellent question, Tyler. Thanks. I mean, I'm, I'm, it's very difficult to make a bit predictions about what's going to happen in Quebec. Okay, what 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 the literature shows us is that the PQ may be a generational party. It may be a party of uh, Gen Xers and Boomers. Basically, I just I just read an article very recently that says you know the PQ's project for Quebec may be on the decline because it may be a generational. Uh, Party. But the question of the Quebec's, the Quebec nation's place in Canada, like Professor Batia said, I mean, this is something that traverses Quebec Canada relations. I didn't even bring up policy. But one of the things that they wanted in Meech Lake, Quebec, was not only just this distinct society clause, they also wanted a guaranteed opt out of federal provincial agreements in the area of social policy. Uh, that Quebec would be able to opt out with compensation. They wanted this written down in the constitution, okay? So this idea of the, the decline of the PQ doesn't mean that Quebec's position on its place in Canada will change anytime soon. That crosses the party spectrum. The Quebec Solidaire is nominally a sovereignist party. The CAQ is led by a former PQ cabinet minister, 
who most of them would, if the circumstances were right, support the sovereignty project. I mean, they know now that Quebecers generally don't support it. So I can't make predictions, but I can tell you this, with or without the PQ, if something would happen in Canada, which would convince Quebecers that Quebec would be better off outside of the Canadian Federation, there would be a party to pick that up in a heartbeat. The Liberal Party, after Charlottetown failed, after Meech failed, before Charlottetown kind of got quickly put together, the Liberal Party of Quebec was toying with having a referendum on Quebec's future in Canada, okay? So Quebecers across the party spectrum see Quebec's place in Canada a certain way, very different than how Canadians see a province's place in Canada. Um, they're not ready right now, most Quebecers, to actually dabble with independence, but if they would be in the very near future, there would be a vehicle that would gladly take that up, PQ or no PQ. Okay. Amazing. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Anyone else? Uh, there was a question. I saw a question here. Okay. okay. Uh, Professor Batia responded. Thanks. <laughs> I'm not good on the trigger here. With, uh... <laughs> it's okay. You're answering the question. So would it apply to Alberta seeking independence, the Clarity Act? Yeah. But again, it's not, it's not binding, right? Uh, oh yeah, the clarity. Yeah, sorry, I was thinking of the secession. Record. Yes, but I, just a little more on the clarity act. Um, for Quebec, the clarity act when it came out. To be honest, most intellectuals in Quebec thought it was a joke. They said, you know, I'll tell you a story. When I was a kid in Quebec, I was seven years old in the 1980 referendum, and we'd walk around and we'd see spray paint "no" and "yes" on walls. I remember this very clearly. And I asked my dad, what's this no and yes business? And he said, oh yeah, Quebec's having a referendum. They want to separate this. Much. And I naively said, but dad, remember I'm seven years old. Why doesn't, why doesn't the prime minister just tell Quebec they can't separate? <laughs> you know, he patted me on the back and said, well, son, you're so naive. Things are not, you know, things are not that easy in politics. And for Quebec, the Clary Act was basically that. It was the federal government saying, oh, you know what? We're going to, we're going to, um, we're gonna decide whether or not we find your process uh, legitimate, you know? And Quebecers thought that was ridiculous, that referendums, that these kinds of decisions takes place within the nation, uh, within the, the, the place that they're gonna affect. At the same time, you know, a balanced approach would say, yeah, but you know, this is a big change to Canada's constitution. And so the rest of Canada sh probably should have some say. For Quebec, that say would come after in the negotiations, for the federal government, what the Clarity Act does is that it gives them a say, gives the Canadian Parliament a say before Quebec actually asks the question and has the referendum, okay? So yes, this will apply to other provinces as well, even though like Professor Batia said, it was meant for Quebec at the time. It was specifically asking a question about Quebec, okay? So yeah. what powers does the federal government have to prevent a province from seceding? What you're asking me? That's a question from Mr. Sam. Oh, sorry, Mr. Chat. Sam, okay. Well, they have zero powers uh, to prevent a province from seceding. The problem is there's no mechanism for a province to secede. You know, most experts will just tell you if a province desperately wants to secede and enough people want to secede in that province, then what happens is you're gonna to have to have negotiations to avert a political crisis. Short of the, those negotiations, secession is gonna take place the way it always takes place. When other states start to, start to recognize the legitimacy of that independent state. And this, in fact, the Supreme Court also said this in their secession records. And in fact, what, what Parizeau was banking on in 1995 was that if Canada wouldn't negotiate in good faith, he would simply, after a year, declare that Quebec was independent. And then try, he, would, he was doing a lot of diplomacy, trying to get France, the US to say, you know, and he would argue that Canada wasn't negotiating in good faith. For a year, they just, he would argue that they, they, they weren't negotiating in good faith. So basically there's no mechanism other than force maybe, but that's never been really part of this discussion. Uh, most observers say that if a province most likely Quebec, but let's say a province would have a referendum that expressed some kind of support for independence, depending on how high the number was, that it would be, 
it, it would be foolish for the rest of the country not to try to negotiate some kind of new constitutional arrangement, okay? Uh, short of that, there are no tools to prevent a province from seceding. In fact, after the, um, the, the, the last, the, the second referendum, um, again, back to social policy, which is what I know, um, you know, the referendum was so close that um, the federal government, led by uh, Prime Minister Chrétien, negotiated with the other provinces the social framework, um, agree a social union framework agreement. And that was essentially putting down on paper um, and committing to only, um, you know, introducing new social programs or any social programs on a, a, you know, bilateral or multilateral basis. So basically the federal government was saying, hey, we're not going to use the spending power that we have. We're not going to expend our political capital on any programs at the, at the national level without buy-in from all of the provinces. So that framework agreement, even though, you know, on paper, it doesn't mean a whole lot, but it certainly set the tone for the nature of the relationship between federal and provincial governments, not just in Quebec. Um, so, it, you know, it, it's still really, really important. Um, and, and, you know, even though there isn't a, a formal sort of mechanism of secession, there are all of these different uh, sort of things that have happened, all of these events and, and negotiations and, and decisions that have led to Canada becoming one of the most decentralized federations in the world. And, and that's not, you know, by chance, um, it's actually a, a long process um, that's evolved this way. And Quebec's had a really sort of central role in, in the way that's happened. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, if you look at Canada's founding, uh, and compared to where Canada is now, Canada, you know, starting off as a highly centralized federation. Uh, but over time, due to a bunch of variables, uh, Canada is now one of the most decentralized federations in the world. And it does have this, a lot of these kind of accommodations for Quebec in what we call political, political asymmetry, a kind of political asymmetry formula for federalism. And, you know, there's a lot of negotiations that take place behind the scenes uh, in Canada to accommodate Quebec that you wouldn't know just by looking at the formal constitutional setup. Mm -hmm. Is there another question here? Yes. Um, if Quebec were to secede, would such a thing be feasible economically, politically, and socially? Uh, well, thank you, Nathaniel. Uh, I mean, this is a huge debate. There's no answer to this. Most economists, I'm not an economist. I, in fact, Professor Batia would probably be able to answer that this better than me. But in the debates I've seen around 1980 and 1995, uh, most agree that the Quebec economy could be a successful economy in the, independent of you know, being run by Ottawa. First of all, the project itself assumes that the association part of it assumes that it would be highly integrated with the Canadian economy anyway. You know, that was sovereignty association in 1980. In 95, we already had free trade. And Quebec was already in the continental uh, uh, economy, integrated in the continental economy. In fact, one of the things the no side used to convince Quebecers to vote no was to say, you know, oh, NAFTA is going to be renegotiated. There's no guarantee Quebec's going to be in it. But most economists agree that, you know, if Quebec was an independent state, not a lot of things would change. Quebec would probably still use the Canadian currency. They might make a request to have kind of junior, a junior position on the Bank of Canada, but there's no guarantee, right? Um, and they would still be highly integrated with the Canadian economy and the North American economy, okay? Socially and politically, yeah, there's no reason why it wouldn't work. The problem most observers, I think, from what I've read over the years, again, I'm not an economist, is that the shock of the political instability of, yeah, you know, the negotiations, they could be protracted, they could last long, might hurt Quebec economically. It might hurt Canada economically too. So, I mean, this would be a huge deal politically. It would mean a whole reformulation of the Canadian constitutional formula. And this might create shock waves. And that initial shock might, you know, markets might go down, investors might get jittery, that kind of thing. But in an ideal world, there's no reason why an economy the size of Quebec could not be successful, particularly since they're already well integrated in North America. Which I think that's the consensus position. Uh, other questions? If such a referendum were to pass, do you believe that there would be a 
uh, partition of Quebec, removing Montreal and, and other federalist areas? Um, Excellent question. Partition became an issue in 1995, but believe it or not, there are a couple of things going on here. The federal government in 1995 basically said partitions on the table in any negotiations, but mostly for indigenous people. Okay? Now, indigenous peoples, the place, their status in Quebec is probably the most difficult issue that confronts Quebec, uh, Quebecers who want independence because indigenous peoples do not want to follow Quebec in that, on that path. And so when we talk about partition, we usually mean, okay, is there anything that could be done for indigenous peoples? Quebec's position has always been no. Quebec's borders are untouchable. Um, and indigenous people in an independent Quebec would simply have to have a new relationship with us as opposed to the crown. Indigenous peoples say, I don't think so. That's not going to happen. So, I mean, we have, a, that's the biggest problem. There's no real, there's no real answer to that question. Now you mentioned Montreal. There were others who would, who were dabbling with this idea of, you know, the West Island of Montreal, some, some counties in the Eastern townships, the, the Gatineau region where there's, um, the Utawa region where there are Anglophone groups, that these groups would have the option uh, for partition. That was never really seriously considered, okay? Uh, it was mostly, the, 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 the issue here was mostly around the sovereignty of indigenous peoples to decide, you know, who they're going to have a relationship with, basically. Is it going to be the crown or is it going to be the Quebec state? And they've rejected this idea that the Quebec state has any you know, control over who they're negotiating with. Okay. Uh, there was another question. It's related. So is there anything in, um, in the law or sort of precedent around how uh, secession would apply to Indigenous peoples, either in Quebec or across Canada? Um, and, and I guess part of the question, um, Sam, you can clarify this if, if I'm wrong, is could Indigenous people also use similar arguments to secede? Is, is that sort of what you were getting at? This, this uh, not secession, the nationhood part. Okay. You know what's funny about, it's not funny, but um, what's funny about this idea of nationhood is, is, is in many ways the product of collective mobilization, right? And one, one article I read many, many years ago put it in a way that I, I find very useful for students is that, you know, Quebec and indigenous peoples make these kind of arguments around the question of nation around the issue of, of nation, but they're very different projects. And in many ways, indigenous peoples have a much stronger moral claim to be recognized as kind of self-determining peoples, but a much weaker kind of political claim in the sense that it's much harder for them to do it. After all, indigenous peoples are not even, haven't even been recognized as constituent members of the Federation before 1982, they were, wards of the state, they were colonized. In 1982, they got some protection through section 35 in the charter, but very little. And over time, they've had to kind of work their way through litigation, through negotiations to try to get recognized, but they're not formally sovereign the way Quebec is. A Quebec, according to my little schema that I talked about, has a much weaker moral claim to, be, to, to kind of be recognized as a self-determining nation. But a much, they have much stronger political clout, political clout. I mean, Quebec is in the federal grid. They are a province. They have borders. They have a constitution that recognizes them in a way that they, they could claim we already have sovereignty. We just want a little more. Whereas indigenous peoples have a hard time politically making that claim. And so there is nothing in law to say, okay, this group has a right to self-determination. This group doesn't. It's all about mobilizing. And it's harder for Indigenous people, basically because they confront so many more challenges. But they, I mean, if, you ask, if I ask all of you, I'd probably get a consensus here that they probably have a stronger moral claim than Quebec. Okay. But Quebec is a recognized constituent of the Federation, right? Uh, one of two founding peoples in our kind of Canadian myth. And, um, and so for them, se secession is just basically 
like a part of the whole constitutional, the possibilities available in the constitutional continuum. It's just a little bit off to another side. For Levesque, sovereignty association, he actually sold the project as beneficial to Canada too. He basically said, well, we're still gonna have this association, but you know, you won't have to deal with us wrecking your plans all the time because we wanna be different. You can kind of do whatever you want. You know, so for him, it was just another kind of constitutional option where Quebec and the rest of Canada had equal status and Quebec is not, I think Levesque said something like Canada consists of two nations hiding behind the fiction of 10 provinces or something like that, right? And so, you know, Quebec is a member of the Canadian Federation. They're recognized, they're, they have constitutional status, they're constitutional players. Indigenous peoples are working really hard to have recognition for their kind of collective existence, but it's much harder for them to do so. Okay. Anyone else? I hope I answered your question. We've got uh, just about 10 minutes left here in our session. So if you do have any other questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat or raise your hand and turn your mic on. Um, we will post some contact info in the chat. If you have questions outside of the session or just need to get in contact with us, uh, please always feel free to do that as well, either through political science or um, us at undergraduate recruitment and admissions. I'm going to put my email in the chat. Um, so if you're interested in Canadian politics, uh, our program uh, offers a concentration in Canadian politics. Um, so you can take a whole bunch of Professor Acabino's courses um, and a few others besides, um, you know, we have courses in provincial politics and, and Ontario politics specifically, uh, as well as, um, you know, uh, Canadian civil society, courses around Canadian civil society. Um, I actually had a, a list of some of the Canadian politics courses that you can choose from, but there's a, a real variety, um, you know, foreign policy, defense, pol uh, North American defense, indigenous politics, um, public opinion and public policy, social power. Um, so th there's lots of different ways of, of uh, studying Canadian politics in our program. And of course, you can combine um, those courses with courses in other um, areas, in other parts of the faculty or other departments. You know, you can hone your French skills, you can um, do some Canadian hist history as well. So there's lots of ways of, of really digging really deep into Canadian politics, or you can take it as one of, you know, a wide range of, of subjects that you study in politics. So, um, you know, you can still take Professor Acabino's course because he's obviously such a great teacher and take a whole bunch of others as well um, and really sort of get that breadth um, of, of knowledge about politics, both in Canada and around the world. I just wanna thank everyone. Thanks for inviting me. This was actually fun. And um, I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, come to Carleton. It's, uh, it's a great place. Um, and study Canadian politics. <laughs> Professor Bucky and I will be happy. <laughs> That's right. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say goodbye. If you guys have any other questions, uh, uh, Ashley and Vanda will, I'm sure, still, you guys will still, will still be there. Okay, I'm yes, going to say bye because I kind of have to run. But uh, thank you for inviting me and thanks for listening. I hope you had fun. Bye. Thanks, Rafael. Thanks. Okay, so if there's any last questions, feel free to, again, drop them in the chat or um, raise your hand and just turn your mic on. Um, we want to thank you guys for, for joining us this evening. Um, and really appreciate the, the time it took out of your day to come. I hope you guys enjoyed your little taste into political science and what that looks like uh, as a Carleton student. Um, as we said, we've got lots of questions. Um, please feel free to reach, us, reach out to us after the event um, and through your process of becoming a Carleton student. Yes, absolutely. And send me an email if you have any questions. <laughs> I'm happy to chat with you anytime. So good luck. Um, I hope to, we'll see you in, in person in the next few months. Enjoy the rest of your night.